I would like to welcome you all on behalf of Sook and her daughters, and they express their thanks for you all being here today to celebrate and remember Al. We are actually going to begin with the military honors this morning uh, instead of having that at the end. So I invite you to remain seated as we have the flag presentation to honor Al's military service.
we will now begin our time of worship. Friends, we gather this morning to celebrate the life of this man of God, this man of family, this man of the church, a loyal friend, a faithful employee. Al certainly left this world a better place than he found it. We also gather to grieve, grieve the loss of a husband, a father, a brother, a friend, and thus, ultimately, and most importantly, we gather to run to Jesus, our only comfort in life and in death, our only hope. There is no one who hates death more than Jesus does, and there is no one who has done more to defeat death than Jesus did by dying and rising again, and the promise that we will, all, we will too rise again with him in the last day, those who trust in him. We honor the life and memory of Al Cadwell, who joined his Lord in heaven on November 30. Al was born in Marquette, Michigan on December 22, 1961, and grew up in Orlando, Florida. He earned his BSBA degree in finance and management at the University of Florida and his MBA at San Francisco State University. He served as a lieutenant in the U.S. Navy and worked most recently for the Duke University Health System. Al's character was refined through suffering, and it was a gift to his family and friends to see the man that God created him to be. That man became more visible as his understanding of God's love and the cross grew. I thought I'd read a text I got from um, a man that, he, that Al mentored the last couple years of his life that was sent to me on the day of his passing. It said this, Al finished the race well. He wasn't perfect, but lived a life of repentance, one worthy of the upward call of the gospel. He was not afraid of death because of how he lived. May we all die so well, and may his passing into glory cause a ripple in the lives of those around him. We rejoice with Al that he is face to face with our Lord now. Would you rise as God calls us into worship from Psalm 8? O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, all the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Heavenly Father, we know that Al would like nothing more than for us to lift up the name of Jesus, that he would be glorified and magnified in our hearts and in our midst this morning together. So we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would make much of your Son in our midst, that you would glorify him as we worship together and remember uh, the, what you did through Al in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's remain standing as we sing together. Yeah. 
understanding as we sing in Christ alone. reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through 12, and verses 16 through 18. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. 
For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Two scripture readings. The first one is from Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. And uh, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and you and you will take my yoke upon you. I'm sorry. Uh, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And then over in Philippians 4, 6 through 8, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, Whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Dan said that would be a long walk, and I didn't believe him, and he was right. Um, I met my father 23 years ago, three months and 27 days. I was only a baby at the time, but many of you have known him far longer than I did. Um, If you knew him, it's like he was a giver. He gave his time, his support, his love, and his humor, and many more things. Um, but he gave me some of the most important parts of himself to me. Um, He gave me my love of reading and of literature, especially for J.R.R. Tolkien. I'm sure you've seen the remembrance table out there, you'll know. Um, He started reading The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit to Sarah and I when I was only eight, Um, and it's been a great love of mine ever since. He gave me my love of music, both old and new. I think there was a playlist in here, so you got to a little taste of that. Um, Some of my fondest memories are of us going to the North Carolina Symphony concerts for the Star Wars movies. Um, He also gave me my dance moves, which I will not demonstrate because according to my dad, I have old white man's disease. (laughs) So I don't think any of you would enjoy that. Um, But most importantly, he gave me his integrity, my strong work ethic, my love for my family, Um, I may not be perfect at these things, but I have the most perfect role model I could have ever asked for. So, thank you. They say that losing your dad is like a vacuum cleaner. It really sucks. (laughs) If you knew my dad, and I hope for your sake that you did, uh, you would know that he loved dad jokes. Um, and that he never took himself too seriously. I remember when I was little, um, I told him that I was afraid of when I would have to say goodbye for the last time. So he sat me down on the swing outside and he told me that when that day comes, he wanted me to throw a party, wear bright colors and have a cake. Um, At the time I thought that was ridiculous. How could anyone celebrate at a time like that? I think I understand now. There are a lot of things that I wanted to do with him but I never got the chance to so I treasure every moment that we did spend together. 
He loved all of the little things that make life beautiful, and it was so evident in the way that he treated each day like a gift. Every vacation, he would wake up at the crack of dawn to see the sunrise with a cup of black coffee in hand. Beyond that, he took the time to appreciate all the small details that we tend to miss. I'll still see him in the sunrise, in the colorful leaves of autumn, in the hypnotic spin of the record player. I hope all the things that I never got to say to him will find his ears. And I hope that I make him half as proud as he made me. I hope a lot of things because he taught me how. Oh, Dan has a little clock up here. <laughs> That's to keep time, I guess. I never knew that. Now I do. Okay. All right, keeping time. <sighs> Greetings to all of you. And on behalf of my family, I thank you for coming and celebrating Al's life with us. As the girls have said, Al insisted that we throw a party after he was gone. And so today, that's what we are going to do. I'm going to do my very best to tell you and share a very tiny snapshot of this wonderful, godly man. He was my best friend. We met at the University of Florida in 1982, and we've reminisced about the accuracy and clarity of that first meeting. <laughs> but suffice it to say that he was the fun, easygoing guy in marching band, having fun, meeting his best friend's girlfriend for the first time, this very rigid and very boring gal. Well, fast forward because you don't need the details. He graduated and worked in the finance world, and then he joined the Navy. He served as a supply corps officer on the Anchorage, and it was during this ser his service when he was deployed to the Persian Gulf that I started sending him packages and letters. And our friendship picked up from there. When he returned to the Bay Area, he continued, we continued corresponding. He was in California, and I was in Florida, and we dated long distance for two years. Remember, this is back in the um, late 80s and 90s. There was no FaceTime, no Zoom, no texting, no unlimited minutes. <laughs> <laughs> And so we raked up very, very expensive phone bills until he came up with an idea. I think it was an idea that Ken Young had, I think, about recording uh, our thoughts on a mini recorder. And so we would send cassettes back and forth, uh, sharing just what we had experienced that day, what we were thinking. And uh, it was a really sweet way for us to have strengthened our relationship. And I loved it. We married in 1995 in Florida. But soon afterwards, we moved to Nashville. It was a very hard time for me because I moved away from my family, which, whom I was very close to, and a church that I loved. And his job kept him away for long, long hours, and he would return home totally drained. And after many months of this, we decided that we needed to make a change. We had always loved North Carolina, and so over a holiday weekend, we visited Raleigh and Charlotte. We were both star for jazz music. You would think Nashville, the music city, would have jazz, but they didn't at the time. And so, as we were driving into Raleigh um, and looking for a radio station, I found a jazz station. We saw that as a sign from God to move to Raleigh. <laughs> Today, that jazz station no longer exists, but maybe it did serve its purpose, and it moved us here to Raleigh. So Raleigh has been our home ever since, and before Hannah was born, we decided that I would quit my job. Sarah was born the following year. We made the decision to be a one-income family so I could be home with the girls. We chose to homeschool them, something that neither one of us had ever heard of prior to having children. There were many blessings and challenges, but we really treasured those days. We often joked in our house that dad was in his box. And what that meant was that when he was doing or thinking of or doing just one thing, as most women would know, we would be doing multiple boxes at the same time. 
Now, I later learned that he was really good in that one box. And what, what he was doing, he worked on it, and he did it really well. While the multi-boxer that I was in was often doing too many things, but nothing really well. I learned from watching him that there really was more than one way to do th most things. For instance, he reminded me early in our marriage that if I wanted his help, folding laundry, for example, I would not refold the things that he had just folded. <laughs> I'm sure you guys don't understand that, but <laughs> I was very guilty of that. And there were many examples, we won't go into that. I also learned other lessons from him. He helped me to truly appreciate music. If it was up to him, we would be here singing all day. And um, I had very good counsel. We only chose enough songs to keep you here. So <laughs> he showed me how music was woven into all movies. And I know most of you might know this, but you would listen to a soundtrack. You know that music is in the, in the movie. But he would say, do you see how this would enhance the scene? Uh, I mean, just things like that that I never thought of. And so music was very important to him. He could tell me, he would listen to a piece and he could tell me all the different instruments that were being played. So to say that he loved music was an understatement. He really saw music as a gift from God. Music spoke to him, brought him joy, comforted him. He also had a very amazing memory when it comes to music. He would hear a song and he would say the name of the song, who did it, what year it came out, which album it was. Kind of freak, I know. <laughs> um, but it was really kind of funny because we would hear something and I would say, where is that from? And he would tell me. And he, it was almost 99% correct. I also learned to love history through him. He, he was a voracious reader and he would read about history. He could tell me about a conflict or a battle and he could tell me exactly who was involved. Uh, who won, why it happened, why it could have been different. Anyway, needless to say, he would have been wonderful at Trivia Pursuit. You would have wanted him on your team. I would be remiss if I didn't mention one of his favorite activities, working out. He was indeed a gym rat. He often said a bad day at the gym is better than no day at the gym. And when he was so single and living in the Bay Area, he was known to work out for three hours a day. And no, he did not do that after we got married. <laughs> when the girls were little, he would head to the gym when it opened at five, work out, and then come home so I could head to the gym. Working out helped him in so many ways to cope with the stresses of the day and to help with many health issues. One of the biggest lessons I learned from Al was about forgiveness. A number of years ago, I learned about Al suffering trauma as a child, and I didn't, he didn't realize how much that affected his well-being. And he didn't have a healthy way of coping with difficulties and stresses, and it affected our marriage in very painful ways. And until it was brought to light, he was not freed from it. Dealing with that was one of the hardest but most rewarding journeys for him and for us. And I truly saw a very repentant soul. It grieved him to see how much he had hurt me and the family. And he truly grasped the cost of the cross. And he sought out the forgiveness of each family member to restore trust and a relationship again. And I learned forgiveness is not forgetting the hurt someone inflicted upon you. It requires remembering that you cannot change or fix the perpetrator, but you can take charge to fix yourself, whether by distancing yourself or getting help to work through it. Acknowledging and addressing it allows you to begin the journey to healing. Healing is necessary because unforgiveness can manifest itself in physical, emotional, and spiritual pain. And I can tell you that from my own experience, that forgiveness helped me to live again. If you read Al's Caring Bridge site, he often wrote about what a wonderful caregiver I was. But what I didn't get to say was that it was really a pleasure for me to take care of him. 
He was kind, he was grateful, and he was so easy to take care of. His care team at the hospital would often tell me what a wonderful patient he was. He rarely complained and was such an encourager to them. In one of his postings, he wrote, it probably seems crazy, but I'm grateful to God for having to face and battle cancer in 2020, and again in the current cancer journey. Not because I'm glad to have cancer, but for the things I am learning. And I certainly have a long way to go. I'm seeing more clearly how facing our own mortality, whether through a health crisis or the inevitability of physical and health decline from growing older that I am also already experiencing, is a way that God uses to slowly peel away our grip on the things of this world and this life. He is redirecting my heart and focus towards eternity and towards home. It is true, before his cancer, Al sought fulfillment through his work. And early on in our marriage, he endured several layoffs and firings. He returned to get another degree in accounting in hopes of making a career change. At this point, he had already gotten an MBA, but he felt that he just had to succeed. But the cancer forced us to slow down. I also am grateful for that time because it forced both of us to ponder what was truly important and to let go of things. The Lord's Prayer speaks of the Lord giving us our daily bread. We found that truly comforting. We knew that God would give us exactly what we needed for that day, not just the food, but for the, not just food for the body, but all our needs for just that day. And we saw how he provided for us in amazing ways. It really was a time that we learned to trust him and to wait on him. His cancer journey also drew him closer to nature. He often marveled at God's creation Going on walks with him was often very slow because he would stop, pick up leaves, marvel at the shape, design, and whatever else. <laughs> Where's Lauren? Lauren, I want you to know that he loved the leaves that you and Chloe picked for him. We still have them. I will really miss our daily conversations. I will miss his calm presence. We read together often. We listened to podcasts together. We also enjoyed silence together. He was a voracious reader, both in print and online, and he often gleaned something that he would share with me and I'm sure many of you. And we had many, many discussions. And sometimes he challenged my thinking on a particular topic. And when we disagreed on, it, on anything, he was wonderful at letting me spout my thoughts never making me feel inferior, silly, or wrong. I will also miss his encouragement and his words of affirmation. He never shied away from affirming our daughters, and he was always very proud of them. <clears throat> Elle left us all a gift on Caring Bridge of the many lessons God was teaching him, things he had learned through his suffering, You'll find a lot of wisdom there. It helps in our grief to remember Deuteronomy 31, 6, which says, be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. And our God is the source we rely on today and tomorrow for our strength, courage, and hope. Al often signed off with Sola Deo Gloria. So I'd like to close with that as well. So join me in honoring Al for the man he came to be and give God alone all the thanks and glory for him. He was a wonderful husband, father, and friend. Al was known as a very enthusiastic worshiper. So in honor of Al and uh, out of love for the God that he loves so well, let's stand and continue to sing together.
seated. <clears throat> Death is not natural. It's not the way it was meant to be. Death is a thief, a destroyer, and an intruder. God did not design it. Though death is universal, though many today believe this is just the circle of life, that's not how God designed this world. Actually, death entered into the world because we chose to live outside of God's design. We chose to ignore the way life was meant to be. And in so doing, the consequences of that rebellion 
brought sickness and sadness, hatred and rebellion. And the message of the Bible from the very beginning is that God in his love is going to restore that. That he's going to reconcile, that he's going to take the consequences and the effects of death and the alienation that we experience from God and internally in ourselves and an alienation with others, and he's going to make things right. And so the story of the Bible is one beautiful story of how God will reconcile all things together, and he'll do that through his son, Jesus. See, the sting of death is sin, and that poison has been taken by Christ The Apostle Paul wrote this, he says, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O death, where is your victory? And he could write that because Jesus himself in John 11 said, I am the resurrection and the life. And whoever believes in me, yet though he dies, he will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Well, Alan Sook believed that truth with all of their being. And it is the belief in that good news, the gospel, that has enabled them to face the challenges and hardships of life. It was the, that good news of reconciliation and restoration that comes from the hope of the gospel that enabled them to forgive one another, to enable them to find strength as they went through two rounds of uh, leukemia, And it is that strength that has helped Sook in particular at the unexpected physical death of Al. And because of Al's love for the Lord of the Rings, I too can geek out for a second here. And there's a, in the end of uh, the Return of the King, it says this, is this the end? No, the journey doesn't end here. Death is just another path, one that we all must take. The gray rain curtain of this world rolls back and turns to silver glass. And then you see it, white shores and beyond, a far green country under a swift sunrise. Friends, physical death is really the full entryway into life and fullness in Christ. And it sounds odd, but as one man said, death only makes us better because we become more full. So I was working on a passage, and I, and I had uh, kind of written my first draft <laughs> and realized this is the wrong passage. Um, so I decided, um, and, and some of that came just talking to, to Sook as they were trying to pick songs, like how do we limit songs to sing? Because every week we sang Al's favorite songs. <laughs> That's a lot of favorites. I'm not sure he knew what that word meant. But um, music was such a joy for him, Uh, and Al would often text me a link with a new song or words from a a song we sang, and it it just brought joy because he loved to sing of the grace and the mercy and the greatness of God. And if you know Al, he was a loud singer, Uh, and he was an energetic singer. He would would do this a lot as he sang, you know, and and, I mean, he he was a loud singer. So I want us to think about loud singing this morning, but not owls. I want to think about God's loud singing over his people. So there's this beautiful passage in Zephaniah, um, and uh, Zephaniah is a smaller book. It's in the Old Testament, and uh, so I want to give a little setting for you to kind of understand the beauty of this passage. Uh, The people of God were really struggling with their faith. Um, They uh, were really questioning the goodness of God. Uh, They really questioned whether God was going to keep his promises, whether it was worth following him, and a lot of them had decided it really wasn't. Uh, And a lot of children of children were going to say, like, that's my parents' faith. This isn't my faith. And they began to find, to try to find security in a lot of other things. And so uh, the writer reminds them, like, hey, you're trying to find your security in your finances, and that's not going to make it. Uh, You're trying to find security in your other relationships, and that's not going to be able to sustain sustain the weight of this world. And they began to look, even at that time, to other gods, uh, other gods of other countries, and say, well, I think they will offer this. And in the midst of that discouragement, uh, in the midst of that kind of letting go of this faith, Zephaniah gives this incredible promise. 
And he says, sing O loud, O people of God. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughters of Jerusalem. For the Lord has taken away the judgment against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. And you shall never again fear evil. And on that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, fear not, O Zion. Fear not, people of God. Not, let not your hands grow weak. Don't let the things of this world overcome you. Don't let anxiety weigh you down. But instead, know this truth. The Lord your God is in your midst, and he is mighty to save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love, and he will exult over you with loud singing. Let me read 17 again. The Lord your God, and there... If you had your Bibles with you, you would see it's all caps. And in, whenever you see all caps in the Bible where it says Lord, that's actually God's personal covenant name. Sometimes you may hear the church talk about Jehovah or Yahweh. That's like, not just calling me Mr. Seal, that'd be Dan. So and this is God's covenant name. And he says, Yahweh, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who promised that I'm going to be your God and I'm going to rescue you and reconcile you and make the heavens and the earth new. I'm the one who is with you. And then he says, I am mighty and I will save you. I will be your security. I will be your strength. I will be your hope. All those other things that aren't holding you up, I am sufficient. And then it says he'll rejoice over you with gladness, with delight. You know, it's one of the things that's sad, I think, when we miss the real message of God's love and his whole plan to reconcile people to himself and to one another. Christianity can often come across as a list of a moral code. And that if, you, if you're good enough, God will love you. And if you're good enough, then you can be part of the church. And that's not the message of the gospel. That's not what Al and Sook believe. That's something far different. That is not the grace of the gospel, that, uh, the story of how God rescues us. This says God is glad and delights over you, not because of what you do, but because of the mighty one who saves. So this time of year, at Christmas, we celebrate the coming of God in the flesh in Jesus. And one of his names that he said is, my name is Emmanuel, which means God with us. So this promise, kind of hidden in the small book in the Old Testament, is showing that the way God's promises have been kept are by Jesus, Emmanuel, who is God with us, who is the one who saves us. And see, the good news of the gospel is this, that we are made right with God, we are reconciled with God, not by being good, for no one can be good enough, but we are reconciled by Jesus, the God-man who lived the perfect life and never sinned and died a sinner's death as a substitute in our place. And you heard Sook share a little bit about Al's story. How he did kind of trust and look to money to be a security. And so he needed to find degrees to bring job security that he wanted so desperately. And what freed him was seeing the security that ultimately could only come from the Lord. That these other things that he loved and valued began He began to let go of them in many ways, particularly at the end, because he saw the sufficiency and the greatness of a merciful God. His security, his identity wasn't in whether others would accept him or forgive him or love him. It was that he was forgiven and accepted and loved in Christ. He was known. And so this beautiful picture, God delights over his people. Again, sometimes that's missing in the church. We think God's just kind of looking at us. Sometimes we have this picture, okay, Jesus likes me, but God's the one who's just like, "Mm." God the Father in his love sent the Son. And he looks at his Son. And those who have faith in Jesus, when he looks at you, he says the same thing that he said to his Son, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. And why there was this great message that when we enter heaven, we want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And everyone who's in Christ is going to hear that because what God sees is the righteousness, the perfect life of Jesus as our record. So he sings over us with joy. He doesn't just kind of go, you know, Dan's, gal, he got him by the skin of his teeth. 
No, he says, my son delights in him. And Al knew that. That's why the songs of God's grace and mercy and forgiveness and the songs about the cross made him realize that his sins, which he felt poignantly and saw the effects of, had been paid in full by Jesus Christ. And that's why there's this other beautiful line, he will quiet you by his love. That image is of a mom holding her child who just skinned their knee and letting them know, it's okay, I'm with you, I'm here. And then it says he sings over you with loud singing. Isn't that an amazing thought? That God sings over his people with joy for you? Because so often I feel like God's just putting up with me. Because I'm often just putting up with me. But he delights over his people. Al tasted that in corporate worship every week. That's why every song is a favorite. Because it reminded him of what Jesus had done for him. It quieted his soul about his failures and reminded him how much he was completely loved by Jesus. There would be no greater joy for Al or Sook if today, for those of you who do not yet know Jesus, who maybe have misunderstood the message of the gospel, if today you understood that Jesus delights in you because of his grace, not your performance, and you were able to, for the first time today, to hear the Lord sing over you with joy, oh, that would make their lives. Because I want us to think not just about God's loud singing. I want you to think now for a second about Al's loud singing. But now I'm going to do one more quote from the Lord of the Rings. All right. And we were talking about this a couple, about two weeks before he went into surgery. I had just finished listening to the Lord of the Rings. Uh, and there's this scene, and, and listening to it was even better than reading it this time. There's uh, the, the victory has just been won. The, the ring was destroyed. And the eagles who had helped come and bring, uh, turn the tide in the battle were now s soaring towards the city. And there was this sense of the victory. And this is what Tolkien writes. For the shadow departed and the sun was unveiled and light leaped forth. In all the houses of the city, men sang for joy that welled up in their hearts from what source they could not tell. And even as they began to sing and celebrate, the eagle confirms their joy, telling them, and this is what the eagle is saying, the black gate is broken, your king has passed through, and he is victorious. Your king shall come again, he shall dwell among you all the days of your life. And in this cry, the eagles were heralding the joy of the conquering king. And it's pointing us to what Christ accomplished that we celebrate at Easter. The church wrote a bunch of cards and signs for him and hidden in there I wrote, and I don't know if you ever saw it, but I put a quote from the Lord of the Rings. It says, the hands of the king are the hands of a healer. And Al is healed. And I want you to think about Al's last singing, not here, but in heaven. In Revelation 19, it talks about the angels who are gathered together singing loudly, praise God, salvation and glory and power belong to our God for his judgments are good and true. Hallelujah for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself known. Al is now singing on his tiptoes in heaven with the choirs of angels. And that's why Paul wrote to us that we don't grieve as those without hope. Sook is grieving. Her amazing composure here is a gift of the Lord because she had things she wanted you to know. 
but we wept. We wept as a family around the table as the doctor talked to us. Uh, We wept as we sang Amazing Grace. Uh, They wept as they were with him with his last breath. She wept the next morning when she woke up at home alone, and she has wept and will weep. Because Christians will grieve, but not without hope. We don't have to try to put the pain away or just act like it didn't happen. But we have the hope that we will see again. See, again, the Christian message is this. Heaven isn't just where you go and you stay disembodied and you sing in a choir the rest of your life. Al might like that, but I won't. (laughs) The Bible says he's going to make a new heavens and a new earth where there is no more sin and sickness and sorrow and that our bodies will be reunited with our souls. And what that means is Sook and Al will see one another again. If you are in Christ, you will see Al again. We will be together in the new heavens and the new earth. And so one early church father you may have heard of named St. Augustine says this, we have hope based on the most assured promise that as we have not lost our dear ones who have departed from this life, but they have been merely sent them ahead for us. We also shall depart, and we shall come to that life where more than ever their dearness to us will be proportional to the closeness we shared on earth, and where we shall love them without fear of parting again. That's why we as Christians can grieve with hope. I have tears because I know the grief this family is having. I have tears for knowing I will not get another text from Al quoting Tolkien or giving me another song to listen to. But I have hope and joy because I know I'll see him again. And Sook knows she will see him again. And Alan Sook would love nothing greater than know they will see you again on the other side of eternity. That is the good news of the gospel. That is the difference why we can have joy in a Christian celebration of death. Because death isn't the end. Death is the great intruder. Death is a thief. But Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And he sings loudly over us with joy. And one day we will sing in heaven with him and one day in the new heavens and the new earth. And that is the hope of the good news and the gospel, that God is with us. And that God is going to be with you and he will quiet your souls as you grieve, but not without hope. Because Christ is the resurrection and the life. And he sings loudly over us. Let's pray together. Father, we are thankful for your steadfast love. And that we are always in your care. And that Jesus, Emmanuel, is God with us. Thank you that you promised to comfort those who mourn by your word, by your spirit, and through the love of your people. We especially pray for Sook and Hannah and Sarah, and all the family and friends, that they might know the presence and peace of God, and that you might enable us to hear the sound of your joyful, exulting singing over us and over Al, and to know that his is one of the choir, voices of the choir now, singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Lord, we ask that the gospel would provide deep comfort, knowing that to live is Christ and to die is gain, that to depart in the body is to be with Christ, which is much better. We grieve, but with hope, knowing that with Christ there is no more suffering for Al, no more pains, no more leukemia. And we know that at Jesus' right hand is the fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. May we remember the humble, joyful pursuit of Al looking to Jesus for his identity and security and striving to cling to and become more like Jesus. O Lord, in the weeks and months ahead, would you meet every need of the family in their time of loss? Be with Sook as she goes through daily tasks without her husband and best friend. Be with the girls as they move into this next season of life without their dad. And may you give them true joy and peace. 
Thank you for your word that reminds us we are always in your care. You quiet us with your love. You are with us. Enable us to worship you, to call out to you, to trust you as our model for us. To you alone be the glory, O Lord. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand and loudly sing Amazing Grace. was great. 
So the next thing is called a benediction. And if you aren't around the church a lot, you may not know what that means, but it really means good words. They're good words from God um, that he says to us. Um, you're going to see some people with their hands out like this. Uh, you don't have to do it. I'm the one, like, if you tell me to do it, I'm like, I'm not doing it. So you don't have to do it. But when you do this, what we're doing is we're opening our palms and saying, Lord, pour out your blessing. So receive now these good words from our great God. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for nothing shall separate us from his love, neither height, nor depth, nor principalities, nor powers. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. I'm going to ask all of you to take a seat. At this time, the family is going to make their way out. And then I'm going to release you in just a few minutes. And so if you all can make your way out. I'd like to thank you for coming and supporting them. Um, it's been amazing to see how you as friends and coworkers and family have supported them. Uh, please don't let that support uh, slow down, particularly in the months down the road. When your life goes back to normal, theirs will not. Uh, please, if you can, stay. Uh, there's plenty of food there they would love um, to see, especially those of you who have come from a long way. Uh, you may notice the girls are not wearing name tags. They say, please, no hugs. So please honor that unless they come to hug you. Uh, it is good to be with you. And I pray that you go in the peace of the Lord and that you know he sings loudly over you. Thank you for coming. <laughs>